Hi everyone, it's Professor Primitin. In this video, we want to finish up our discussion on continuity of functions. So in the previous video, we talked about the definition of continuity using limits, and we also talked about the different types of discontinuities for a function. So in this video, we're going to talk about continuity properties to determine intervals, open intervals and closed intervals, of continuity for various functions, and also use sign charts to solve both polynomial and rational inequalities. All right, let's pick up where we left off in the previous video. We left off at one-sided continuity and continuity on an interval. We can also talk about one-sided continuity in a similar way that we discuss continuity using two-sided limits. So one-sided continuity, a function is continuous on the left at x equals a of the limit as x approaches a from the left side of f of x is the function evaluated at x equals a. And on the other hand, a function is continuous on the right at x equals a if the limit as x approaches a from the right side of f of x equals f of a. So these two definitions give you an idea of what it means for a function to be continuous on only one side, rather than looking at the limit from two-sided approach. So what does it mean that a function is continuous on an interval? If a function is continuous on an open interval, a comma b, so this is the open interval not including a and not including b, but all the x values between a and b, the function is continuous on this interval if the function is continuous at every single point between x equals a and x equals b, but not including the endpoints. And a function is continuous on the closed interval, square bracket a comma b square bracket, then the function is continuous on every single x value between a and b, so the open interval a to b, but also continuous on the right at x equals a, because you can only approach x equals a from the right side on this interval, and it's also continuous on the left at x equals b, because you, again, you can only approach x equals b from the left side for this interval. So to give you an idea of what it is meaning for a function to be continuous on an open interval or a closed interval, let's look at example four, the greatest integer function. Let f of x equal, and this is the notation for the greatest integer function, it's a double square bracket around x, be a function such that f of a, and this is how the greatest integer function is defined, f of a is defined as the greatest integer less than or equal to a. So whatever you're plugging in for the x, it's the greatest integer that's less than the value that you're plugging in. So this is what the graph looks like. The greatest integer function is what's called a step function because it looks like the graph forms steps. Okay, now here's how you actually get the graph. If you're plugging in a value, you're looking for the greatest integer that's less than or equal to the value that you plugged in. So here's a few examples. f of 3.2. What's the greatest integer that's less than 3.2? It's 3. When you plug 3.2 into this function, the y value is 3. So when you plug in 3.2, the y value is 3. So there's a point on the graph. If you plug in 5.6, you get 5. It's the greatest integer that's less than 5.6. So this function does not round up, okay, or round down. It's the greatest integer that's less than 5.6. So when you plug 5.6 in, the greatest integer that's less than 5.6 is 5. So 5.6, it will be up here at 5. F of negative 1.2. Now you have to be a little careful with the negative values when you plug in because it's the greatest integer that's less than negative 1.2. Negative 1 would be greater than negative 1.2. So when you plug negative 1.2 in, the greatest integer that's less than that is negative 2. So negative 1.2 would be here. The y value is negative 2. And then if you plug in an integer like 4, f of 4, the greatest integer that's less than or equal to 4 is 4, because 4 is an integer. So when you plug in 4, that's why there's a point at 4. It's filled in. All right, number 1. Find the limit as x approaches 1 from the left side of f of x. So we're looking at x equals 1 from the left side. So here's x equals 1, but we're on the left side, so it's this part of the graph. We're approaching 1 from the left side. The y values are approaching this hole in the graph, which is at y equals 0. So the y values approach 0 as x approaches x equals 1 from the left side. Number 2, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right side of f of x. So here's x equals 1 again. On the right side of x equals 1, you're on this part of the graph, where the y values are actually approaching y equals 1. This, so as x approaches 1 from the right side, the y values are approaching 1. Okay, number 3. What is the y value at x equals 1? What is f of 1 equal to? So f of 1, well, I'm looking at x equals 1. When I plug in 1, here's the point. The y value is at 1. So f of 1 is equal to 1. Number 4. Is the function continuous on the left? at x equals 1. So this is going back to the definition for a function to be continuous on the left side of x equals 1. We need to check that the limit as x approaches 1 from the left side of the function is equal to the y value at the function at x equals 1. All right, so let's check the left side. The limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x. 
So we found that out in part one. The limit was equal to zero, as x approaches one from the left side. But we found out that f of one, which is the right side that we're trying to compare it to, that was in part three, f of one was equal to one. Since these two are not equal to one another, the function is not continuous on the left side of x equals one. All right, number five. Is the function f of x continuous on the right at x equals one? So again, using the definition for continuous on the right side of x equals one, we need to check that the limit as x approaches one from the right side of f of x is equal to the y value at x equals one. So if you look at the limit as x approaches one from the right side of f of x, that was in part two, which is equal to one. And we found out that f of one, which is the right side that we're trying to compare it to, f of one was equal to one, that was in part three. So since these two are equal to one another, it satisfies the definition for the function to be continuous on the right at x equals one. So looking at the graph, the function is not continuous on the left at x equals one because there's, it's approaching a hole in the graph, so it's not continuous on the left, but the function is continuous on the right because you're approaching a filled in point. Okay, the point actually exists there. So number six, is f of x continuous at x equals one? Notice that it's not specifying which direction. Is it continuous on the left or the right? It's considering both directions. If it's not continuous, identify the type of discontinuity. So we need to check the definition of continuity that we talked about in the previous video. The limit as x approaches one, so this is a two-sided limit of f of x, is equal to the y value at x equals one. So notice that the limit as x approaches one of f of x, it does not exist because we were approaching two different values from the left side and the right side. The limit as x approaches one of f of x, we were approaching zero from the left side, and the limit as x approaches one from the right side was approaching one. Since the one-sided limits are not equal to one another, that means the two-sided limit does not exist, and so that means we can't compare the limit and the y value for the function at x equals one. The limit doesn't even exist, so the function is not continuous at x equals one. And now, looking at the graph, we know why it's not continuous. There is a jump discontinuity at x equals one. The graph is approaching zero from the left side, it's approaching one from the right side of x equals one, and then the graph has to jump values. So the type of discontinuity is a jump discontinuity. Number seven, is the function continuous from the left at x equals two? So again, using the definition of continuous on the left, we need to check the limit as x approaches two from the left side of the function, is it equal to the y value at x equals two? So we're going to have to go back and look at the graph. So here's x equals two. We're approaching x equals two from the left side. So that would be this part of the graph. It looks like the y values are approaching this hole in the graph, which is at y equals one. And at x equals two, where's the function's value? At x equals two, the y value is two. So going back to what we're trying to compare, the limit as x approaches two from the left side was one, but the y value at x equals two is two. Since these are not equal to one another, the function is not continuous on the left at x equals two. Okay, number eight, is the function continuous on the right at x equals two? So again, we need to check that the limit as x approaches two from the right side, the one-sided limit of f of x is equal to the y value at x equals two. So again, let's look at the graph. So here's x equals two. We're looking at what happens to the y values as x approaches two from the right side. So that's this part of the graph. The y values are approaching two as x approaches two and the y value at x equals two is also two. And since those are equal to one another, the function is continuous on the right side at x equals two. Okay, number nine, we're gonna talk about what does it mean for a function to be continuous on an interval now. Is f of x continuous on the open interval one to two? So what that means is the function continuous at every x value between x equals one and x equals two. So let's go back and look at the graph. So everywhere between x equals one and x equals two, does the graph have any jumps, holes in the graph, or any asymptotes? That's what we're looking for. So between x equals one and x equals two, not including the endpoints, it looks like the graph does not have any breaks, jumps, or holes in the graph, or vertical asymptotes. So the function is continuous on the open interval one to two. So the function is continuous on the open interval since x equals one and x equals two are not included in the interval. So we're not looking at the hole in the graph at x equals one. Okay, number 10, is the function continuous on the closed interval one to two? So in other words, is it continuous everywhere between one and two? Is it continuous at x equals one? And is it continuous at x equals two? The function is not continuous. The function f of x is not continuous on the closed interval, and we saw that in part nine. The function is continuous on the open interval one to two. The function is continuous at x equals one from the right side. We saw that in the previous part. 
but we know that the function is not continuous at x equals 2 from the left side. So it cannot be continuous on the closed interval 1 to 2. All right, the following example illustrates a function that is continuous on a closed interval, but it's not continuous from the, both the left end and the right end on an interval. So example 5, continuous on a closed interval. We're going to look at this piecewise defined function. So consider the function h of x. It's defined to be y value is 2 if x is less than negative 1. The y value is the absolute value of x if you're between negative 1 and 2, including negative 1 and including 2. And the function is y value of 3 if x is greater than 2. So to give you an idea what this piecewise defined function looks like, let's look at the graph. So the function is y equals 2 if you're less, if the x value is less than negative 1, but not including negative 1. So that's why there's an open circle or open point at x equals negative 1. So the y value is 3 when x is greater than 2. So the y value is 3 when x is greater than 2, not including x equals 2 though. So it's an open circle again. And it's the absolute value of x if you're between negative 1 and 2. So it looks like at negative 1, the absolute value of negative 1 is 1. And at x equals 0, if I plug 0 into the function, I get 0. So it goes through this point. And then if I plug in x equals 1, the absolute value of 1 is 1. And if I plug in x equals 2, I get absolute value of 2 is 2. So it looks like it's this V-shaped part of the graph. Notice that x equals negative 1 and x equals 2, you do include those as points. All right, number 1. Is the function h of x continuous on the closed interval negative 1 to 2? So this will take several steps. Step 1, we need to check that the function is continuous on the open interval negative 1 to 2 first. All right, so from negative 1 to 2, we're looking at this v-shaped part of the graph. Is the function continuous on this open interval? So ignore the endpoints for now. Are there any holes? breaks, jumps, or vertical asymptotes between x equals negative 1 and x equals 2? No. So that means the function must be continuous on the open interval negative 1 to 2. Okay, step 2. We need to check that the function is continuous on the right at x equals negative 1. So let's check that. We're looking at the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right side of the function h of x. So on the right side of x equals 1, the function is approaching y value of 1. And we need to compare this with the function's y value at x equals negative 1. So what is the function evaluated at x equals negative 1? Well, if you plug negative 1 into the function, the absolute value of negative 1 is 1. And so there is a point there, and the y value is 1. Since these two are equal to one another, the function is continuous on the right side of x equals negative 1. Okay. And then the last step, step 3 says you need to check that h of x is continuous on the left side of x equals 2. So again, let's go back to the definition of one-sided continuity. You need to check that the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side of the function h of x. So from the left side of, of x equals 2, you're on this part of the graph. It looks like the y values are approaching 2. And what is the function's value at x equals 2? If you plug 2 into the function, the absolute value of 2 is 2. And so the y values are actually equal to what the limit is approaching at x equals 2 from the, from the left side. So the function is continuous on the left at x equals 2. So the function is continuous on the right side of x equals negative 1. It's continuous on the left side of x equals 2. And it's continuous everywhere between negative 1 and 2. So that means the function is continuous on the closed interval. All right, number 2. Is the function h of x continuous at x equals negative 1? And if it's not continuous, identify the type of discontinuity. So again, notice that it's not talking about a specific type of continuity from the left or the right side. So this is continuous at x equals negative 1 from the left and the right. So to figure out if the function is continuous at x equals negative 1, we need to use the definition that we talked about in the previous video for two-sided limits. The function is not continuous at x equals negative 1 since the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left side of h of x, we did that in a previous problem, it was 2. But if you plug negative 1 into the function, the absolute value of negative 1 is 1. Since these two are not equal to one another, the function is not continuous on the left side at x equals negative 1. So since it's not continuous on the left side of x equals negative 1, it means it's not continuous at negative 1 at all. And so the type of discontinuity is a jump discontinuity at x equals negative 1. And number three, is the function h of x continuous at x equals 2? And if it's not continuous, identify the type of discontinuity. So again, if it's talking about continuity at x equals 2 and not specifying a direction, you have to use the two-sided limit. So the function is not continuous at x equals 2, and we can look at this in terms of the graph. 
the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side of h of x, the y values are approaching 3, but what's the y value at x equals 2? The h of 2 is 2, so since these two are not equal to one another, the function is not continuous on the right at x equals 2. And so that means the function has a jump discontinuity at x equals 2. All right, so now that we know what it means for a function to be continuous on the left and what it means for a function to be continuous on the right, let's talk about continuity properties for functions. If two functions are continuous on the same interval, then we have this property about continuous functions. The sum, the difference, the product, and the quotient of two functions will also be continuous on the same interval, except you have to be a little careful about the quotient function, except for the x values that make the denominator zero. So at this point in the section, we can use this idea that the sum, the difference, the product, and the quotient of two continuous functions is actually continuous to identify where is a function continuous on an interval. So rational functions. They are continuous for all the x values except where the denominator is zero. Even root functions. So if you talk about square roots, fourth roots, sixth roots, and so on, they are continuous for all values of x except for the values where the function inside gives you a negative number because we know we can't take the even root of a negative number. So an even root function is continuous for all the x values except for those that make the inside of the radical negative. And then piecewise defined functions, they need to be checked for continuity where the formula changes because from the previous example we know that there might be a jump where the function changes. Okay, so what does all this mean? Let's look at example six. Continuity on intervals. Determine the continuity for the following functions. Write the interval where the function is continuous. So number one, f of x equals 9x squared subtract 4. We know that this is a quadratic function because the highest power on x is 2, so it's a type of polynomial function. And we know polynomial functions, the domain is the set of all real numbers, or using interval notation, negative infinity to infinity. So polynomial functions will not have any jumps, holes in the graph, or vertical asymptotes. So the function is continuous on the open interval, negative infinity to infinity. Number two, let's look at the function g of x equals the exponential function, base e, so the number e, raised to the x plus one power. Exponential functions, we talked about the domain is the set of all real numbers, so it's negative infinity to infinity for the domain. And again, exponential functions do not have any jumps, holes in the graph, or vertical asymptotes. So the function is continuous on the open interval, negative infinity to infinity. Number three, h of x equals 2x subtract 3 divided by x plus 7. Notice that this is a rational function because you have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. Well, rational functions are not continuous where you have the denominator equal to zero. So let's take and look at the domain for this function. Look at the where the denominator cannot be zero. That means x cannot be negative 7 because if you plug negative 7 in, you'll have zero in the denominator. And so the domain for this function is the set of all real numbers except for negative 7. So negative infinity to negative 7 in parentheses, union, parentheses, negative 7 to infinity. And so we know that there's going to be a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 7 because the y values will approach either infinity or negative infinity on either side of x equals negative 7. And so this is an infinite discontinuity at x equals negative 7. So number 4 y equals the fourth root of 4 minus 3x. So we're talking about an even root. What's inside the radical must be a positive number for any x value that we plug in. So an even root function, we need to make sure that the inside of the radical must be greater than or equal to zero. It must be a positive number or it can be zero. So if you solve this inequality for x, you subtract four on both sides of the inequality. Negative 3x must be greater than or equal to negative four. And then divide by negative three to isolate the x on one side. And remember, if you multiply or divide by a negative number, when solving an inequality, you must reverse the inequality symbol. And so x is isolated on one side, but then the inequality changes direction to less than or equal to. Negative 4 divided by negative 3 becomes positive 4 thirds. So this even root function, the domain, is a set of all x values that are less than or equal to 4 thirds. If I plug in any value that's less than or equal to 4 thirds, the inside of the radical will be a positive number or equal to zero. So this means using interval notation, the domain is from negative infinity to four thirds and it's or equal to, so it's a square bracket on four thirds. And so the function is continuous from negative infinity to four thirds with a square bracket on four thirds. And number five, piecewise defined functions. 
Let's say you have this function z is equal to this piecewise defined function. It's x plus 3 when x is less than 5. It's 5 when x is 5. And it's negative x plus 3 if x is greater than 5. So let's use the continuity properties that we talked about previously. So z equals x plus 3. So z equals x plus 3 is a linear function because x is raised to the first power. It's a polynomial function. So the function is continuous when x is less than 5. So in other words, the function is continuous from negative infinity to 5. For the same reason, if z is equal to negative x plus 3, then you're talking about the x values that are greater than 5. Negative x plus 3 is a linear function or a polynomial function. So the function is continuous. And so it's continuous when x is greater than 5 or 5 to infinity. So notice from these first two steps, we found out that the function is continuous when x is greater than 5, when x is less than 5, but we don't know if the function is continuous at 5 yet. So there's one last step. We're going to find out, is the function continuous at x equals 5? And this is exactly what we were talking about earlier with the continuity properties. For piecewise defined functions, this function is changing formulas at x equals 5. So check continuity for piecewise defined functions where the function changes formulas. So need to check that the function z is continuous at x equals 5. So let's approach x equals 5 from the left side of 5, and we're also going to approach x equals 5 from the right side. So are these three limits equal to one another? The limit as x approaches 5, what is that equal to? What's the limit as x approaches 5 from the left? What's the limit as x approaches 5 from the right? So let's look from the left. The limit as x approaches 5 from the left side of the function. Well, if you're on the left side of x equals 5, you're at this part of the graph, which is x plus 3. So the limit as x approaches 5 from the left side, you can replace z with x plus 3. And so x plus 3 is a polynomial or a linear function. You can plug 5 in for the x. The y values are approaching 8 when x is approaching 5 from the left side. Okay, so the limit as x approaches 5 from the left side is 8. What's the limit as x approaches 5 from the right side? So the limit as x approaches 5 from the right of z, if you're on the right side of x equals 5, then the function is negative x plus 3. So replace z with negative x plus 3. The limit as x approaches 5 from the right side, this is a polynomial or a linear function, so you can plug 5 in for the x. So you'll have negative 5 plus 3, which is negative 2. So the limit as x approaches 5 from the right side is negative 2. Since these two one side limits are not equal to one another, the two side limit does not even exist, and so the function is not continuous at x equals 5. So where is the function continuous? The function is continuous where x is less than 5, so negative infinity to 5. It's continuous when x is greater than 5, so 5 to infinity, but not including 5, because we found out that x is not continuous at x equals 5. To conclude this section, we're going to use a definition of continuity involving the left and the right-hand limits to determine unknown constants that appear in a piecewise defined function. So example 7. Continuity from the definition. Find the values of the constants a and b, so these are unknown constants, inside this piecewise defined function f of x. So what are the constants a and b so that f of x that's defined below is continuous for all real numbers? So the function f of x is defined to be this piecewise defined function. The y values are negative 5 if x is less than 0. It's x squared plus this unknown constant a if x is between 0 and 1, including the endpoints, x equals 0 and x equals 1. And the function is b times x plus 3 if x is greater than 1. So let's approach this one step at a time. So notice that the function is equal to negative 5. Negative 5 is a constant function. The function is always y values negative 5. That's a continuous function. So the function is continuous when x is less than 0. So the function is continuous from negative infinity to 0. The function is x squared plus a. So that's a polynomial function because a is just a real number between 0 and 1. So the function is continuous anywhere between 0 and 1. So open interval 0 to 1. And the function is b times x plus 3, so b times x plus 3 is a polynomial, when x is greater than 1. So the function is continuous for any x value that's greater than 1. So the function is continuous on the interval 1 to infinity. So we found out that the function is continuous from negative infinity to 0, 0 to 1, and 1 to infinity. But we haven't checked what happens at x equals 0 and x equals 1. Is the function continuous at 0 and 1? So if the function is continuous at x equals 0, that means... Using the definition of continuity, the limit as x approaches 0 for the function must be the y value at x equals 0. 
So let's check the one set of limits because we're looking at a piecewise defined function. So if you're on the left side of x equals zero, the y values are always negative five. So the limit as x approaches zero from the left side, the function can be replaced with negative five. And the y values are always approaching negative five when x is approaching zero from the left side. So the limit as x approaches zero from the right side of the function. So if you're approaching zero from the right side, x values are greater than zero. So if x is greater than zero, you're on this part of the graph, which is x squared plus a. So replace the function f of x with x squared plus a. If your x is approaching zero from the right side, and we know this is a polynomial function, you can plug zero in for the x. So zero squared plus a is just a. So the y values are approaching a if x is approaching zero from the right side. What this means is that the two-sided limit as x approaches zero of f of x, this two-sided limit exists if these two one-sided limits are equal to one another. They have to be equal to one another for the two-sided limit to exist. So that means negative five must be equal to a. So a equals negative five. So we found out one of the unknown constants. Okay, and now we're gonna use the same idea to find out what is the unknown constant b. Is the function continuous at x equals one? So we're looking at this definition of continuity for a function. The limit as x approaches one of the function is it equal to the y value at x equals one. So let's look at the one set of limits again, because we're looking at a piecewise defined function. The limit as x approaches one from the left side of the function f of x. If you're on the left side of x equals one, then you're less than one. So it's x squared plus a is the function. So the limit as x approaches one from the left side of f of x, that means you're approaching one from the left side of x squared plus a is the function. And that's a polynomial function, so you can plug one in for the x. So we get one squared plus a, which is a plus one. And we know what the value of a is from the previous work. a is negative five, so replace a with negative five. So negative five plus one is negative four. So the y values are approaching negative four on the left side of x equals one. And now what's the limit as x approaches one from the right side of the function f of x? That means the x values are greater than one. So if the x values are greater than one, the function is b times x plus three. So the limit as x approaches one from the right side of the function, you can replace the function with b times x plus three because you're on the right side of x equals one. And that's a polynomial function, so replace the x with a one. So b times one plus three is b plus three. So the y values are approaching b plus three if you're approaching one from the right side. But again, the two-sided limit exists as x approaches one only if the one-sided limits are equal to one another. So that means b plus three, that's the right-sided limit, must be equal to negative four, which was the left-sided limit. So b plus three must be equal to negative four. And if you solve for b, you'll get b equals negative seven. So we found out the other constant b, it must be negative seven. And so a equals negative five and b equals negative seven. And that means the function f of x will be continuous for all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. There won't be any jumps in the graph if a equals negative five and b equals negative seven. So this finishes our video on one-sided continuity and also continuity properties of functions. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the average rate of change of a function.